How are you all? Great. Have you heard about somebody riding a bicycle on a tightrope when it's dark outside and there are crocodiles in the water below? Heard of that? No? That's what I feel like right now. <laughs> Just kidding. I can't see you all, but you can see me. Have fun. Um, so I think I have 18 minutes, but I want to make sure I can see who's giving me time checks. Great. Thank you. Thanks for that introduction, Fahad. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I can't say how grateful I am to see the energy of this university organizing this event. So first of all, hats off to you guys. Nice job organizing, and thanks for the invitation. I am a little under the weather, so I apologize if I put you to sleep, but I'll try not to. OK, so I have a pretty straightforward and simple message for you guys, I think. Uh, for myself as well. So I'm trained as a civil engineer, as somebody mentioned, Fahad mentioned when he started, and also an urban planner. For many of you probably don't know what an urban planner does. They are the people who are partly responsible for creating our neighborhoods, our cities, our towns, our villages, so that they work for people. In other words, if we like our neighborhood, if we're comfortable letting our child go to the ice cream store nearby, or get to work, or find a job or a kind of housing that we like, then that's a place that works for us. And that's basically what planning is supposed to do. Curiously, planning often thinks about housing, transportation, economic development, you name it. But you know what they don't think about or haven't is the one thing that all of us need. Any guesses? Food. We also need water and air, but I never met a person who doesn't eat. But strangely, we do plan places as if people don't eat. So the key message for today is how about we plan places as if people actually eat? So it's a three-part story. I'm going to tell you about what happens when we don't think about that. And then I'm going to tell you about people who are actually changing the world on our behalf and then leave you with a call for action. All this in 15 minutes. OK. So the first part is when I talk about food or what people eat, that really depends on this rather complicated food system, which enables food to travel from farm to plate and the remnants hopefully back to soil. So it's a soil to soil system. And it really runs on the backs of countless farmers and ranchers. And we rely on that system and presume that the food gets to the people that needs it. But funny thing, the food system doesn't work for everyone. In fact, it doesn't work for those who grow our food, and it doesn't serve people with the least resources in our community. And those are the two groups that I would like to draw your attention to. So the first part, the farmers. There's, there's so many concerns, but in the interest of time, I'm going to stick to six. The first part is for the food system in the US, we've got farmers and ranchers growing food for us, a certain number of entities. And we've got a smaller number that's actually processing the food. And then we've got restaurants and retailers that get the food to us. Great. Look at that consolidation in the food industry. right? That calls the shots for our farmers and determines what happens to our low-income consumers. Well, why does that happen? Because that's the economic incentives drive the system. Take a look at who makes money in the food system. It's not the people you think who should be getting the money from when we spend our food. Farmers are not making the big bucks here. Okay? So then what is happening? If you spent a dollar this morning to buy food, then off that dollar, the average dollar that you spent, majority of that in the US is what's called a post-farm share. A very small portion of that actually goes to the farmer. So something's wrong with that system. That bothers me. The second part of it is this. If you want to get your energy from a chocolate chip cookie, I know how much you love them, you would be paying a dollar. And if you were to get the same amount of energy from a carrot, you would be paying six times as much. So obviously, both of them are providing the same amount of energy, but a very different amount of nutrition. Something wrong with that. But if I were to make a rational economic decision, you know what I'd go for? The chocolate chip cookie. It's also engineered to taste really good. OK, part three. And maybe drawing your attention to this. 
If you have to remember one thing, please pay attention to this. This is our neighborhood. This is our community of Erie County. If you look at comparable neighborhoods, comparable in economic wealth, and you look at predominantly white neighborhoods and the prevalence of supermarkets and grocery stores in white neighborhoods, predominantly white neighborhoods, and you look at comparable neighborhoods by wealth in predominantly black neighborhoods, this is what happens to prevalence of supermarkets and grocery stores. Note that I'm repeating that they are not poor black neighborhoods and rich white neighborhoods. They are comparable in wealth and population density, land area. Something is off in the food retail market. Okay, so then, given these circumstances, what is happening in predominantly white neighborhoods or predominantly black neighborhoods? What kind of food does exist there? So no supermarkets. But what we've got is a prevalence of small stores that are selling food, something called food, but very expensive, really not nutritious, and it's concentrated in lower, in neighborhoods of color. So that's what happens to convenience stores if you go into comparable wealth neighborhoods. Not okay. And then, keep now, so far I've been talking about people with the same money. But within this system, there are people with fewer economic resources. And as a society, we're failing them. We're especially failing our children. So I want to draw your attention to this. When we look at all children in poverty, this is city of Buffalo, by the way, majority of the children in poverty, high majority, more than 80%, are kids of color. So then maybe local government and government is doing something about it. These are results from a national survey asking local governments, are you doing anything about the food system and what people can do to get healthy food? 1% across the country said, we're involved in fixing things for you. 1%. That orange sliver is people who are not doing anything about it. So local government is not doing it. Then what's going on? So that's the bad news finished. Good news from here on. How am I doing? OK. So the next part, before I go to the good news, is I just want to offer a reminder, all of this to say it's not the American that's making bad choices. I hope you'll buy the argument that something's wrong with the American food system. So we do have stories of transformation and hope, literally rebirth to the theme, you know, speaking to the theme of the event happening in our backyard. So I'm going to take you to the west side of Buffalo, which I'm sure many of you have already been to, and tell you the story of a group called the Massachusetts Avenue Project. This is a not-for-profit organization that works with kids, youth, um, training them to be agents of transformation and change. Kids at the Massachusetts Avenue Project, by the way, they're teenagers. They know how to work with teenagers. Um, they teach them how to grow food, how to cook it well, how to eat it, how to share it. They train them how to be entrepreneurs and build their capacity to have a voice in the system. They have on the west side of Buffalo, which if you haven't had a chance to visit, I invite you to come there. Um, they are growing food in what were vacant lots previously. They are raising fish in the city of Buffalo, something called aquaponics, if you're not familiar. They are also recognizing the disparities in food access by taking fresh fruits and vegetables in low-income neighborhoods on a veggie van. That's a mobile market that they take that sells fresh fruits and vegetables at affordable prices. And they teach entrepreneurship skills so kids from Massachusetts Avenue Project uh, develop products that they try to enter into local retail chains and you can actually find chili starters and salsa prepared by kids from MAP at Wegmans and Lexington Cooperative in our region. So these kids and groups like MAP, and by the way, MAP is not the only one. There are groups on the east side uh, that are fixing their own problems. So these are the heroes that are fixing the problems in their neighborhoods. So what should we do and what's not working? Clearly, there's a lot of problems in the food system. Clearly, there are heroes in the story. But the problem is that most of what our heroes do is hindered by public policy. And my pitch, this is the last part, is that we have to figure out how to 
amplify the good work that is happening in communities. And perhaps this is not the jazziest, the sexiest thing to end the talk on, but really, if we don't do this, we're in trouble collectively. So the pitch is three part. The first, all three of those are really with the intention that we should be planning communities as if people are eating. The first part is that we cannot individually, as educators, as people, people living in the city of Buffalo, people being alive, we cannot let it go with incremental change. We cannot pat ourselves on the back because we participate in a food drive. We have to figure out how to make systemic change. So here's a very simple idea. You either donate a can of food, which is also important, do that, please. But consider the possibility of edible landscaping in every public right of way in the city of Buffalo and Erie County. Why not? That's one. The second part is that strange thing called local government planning and policy. Believe it or not, our towns, villages, cities, counties in the US have budgets. They expend those budgets. Those are tax dollars that should be audited to see are they helping support nutrition and hunger, alleviating that and building people's capacity. The final point is that we cannot do all of this presuming that somebody outside of the communities is going to bring salvation to the community. That's not at all the point. The reason I highlighted the heroes that I did earlier is to say that communities are already fixing their problems and we have to band together to amplify the voices and good ideas of people because to plan places as if people eat, we actually have to listen to people. Thank you.